thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Um, it's uh, very nice to have those who are joining us uh, now. It's just after 6 p.m. local time here in Bangkok. Um, obviously, everyone at GIA Thailand hopes you are well and starting to get back to some degree of normality. The last few months have been testing for everybody, so we, we know that uh, a lot of people have been finding difficulty in one way or another, and, and hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel now, and, and we're going to all get through it soon and back to normal. Um, of course, uh, as soon as a virus uh, vaccination comes along for the virus, that would be brilliant, but we have to wait a bit for that. Um, before we reach the main attraction tonight and hear from our important guest presenter, who, as you know, is Victor, you can, I think you can hopefully see him. Um, I thought I should give those of you joining from outside Thailand, uh, at least some idea about GI Thailand's gemstone gatherings. Um, as some of you will no doubt realize, this is the 115th gemstone gathering, but it is in fact our first online gathering session. So hopefully things will become a little clearer with this small presentation we prepared that touches on the event's history. So uh, just for anyone who, who's not familiar, my name is Nicholas Thurman. I'm the senior manager of Pearl Identification um, Bangkok, but I look after Pearls globally. And um, so we'll just uh, go through and uh, I will just give you an idea about the gathering. So it all started uh, in 2007, actually. Um, that's why we've had 114 until today. Um, the, the event was um, instigated or initiated by Ken Scarrett, who used to be the, you know, he was the former uh, director of GIA Thailand and um, GIA Far East. And he's pictured here with Duncan Pei, who in actual fact is our senior vice president and chief academic officer of educational operations. And the first gathering was held in Bisco Tower. Then we moved to Tawana Hotel. And then after that, where we have the venues usually, when, whenever a gathering is held now, today, uh, we go to the Crown Plaza Hotel in, in Lumpini or near Lumpini. Um, so, so that's how it's actually progressed. It started off in the classrooms to the students with a few guests coming from the trade. Then it went uh, to the Hotel Tawana and we had more of the trade coming. And now we have a mixture of students in the trade who come to the Crown Plaza. And over the years, we've had a diverse range of topics covered. You can imagine 114 up till now. Um, there have been a, a lot of uh, topics covered. And we've had, of course, numerous speakers. And during those events, we've had four anniversary events, you know, ones where we've had like special occasions. So for example, the 25th, we had one, and the 100th, we had another. So. And this just gives you a, an idea. I think maybe some of the small images have been covered by, the, by our pictures. But anyway, you, know, you can see a, a, a variety of shots taken from some of these gatherings. There are a few sort of local speakers who have come to, to give presentations. And um, we had a few displays as well, like uh, on the bottom, you can see a, a series of um, pictures of photomicrographs. So we, we've had some various events uh, over the years. And uh, up until today, we used to send out these postcards. Uh, we, as I said, it was a, it's a local um, uh, event. So it only happens in Thailand and in Bangkok. So we used to send out in the mail these postcards, which were designed by our PR team. And they would be of the specific events at the time. So for example, in the top uh, left, you have one about diamonds. In the bottom middle, you have one about golden pearls. And uh, then you have a jade one, a design one. Um, so these were sent out and then people knew that they would be coming to the gatherings for that particular event. That's how we promoted them and online, of course, as well. And now to tonight, the main star attraction, of course, is Victor Tuzlukov. And um, he's going to be speaking to us about uh, the how, why, and when of precision cutting 
Um, Victor, as I'm sure you know, uh, ha hails from Russia and now lives in Thailand, where he is a familiar figure in the industry and a highly respected gemstone cutter. Uh, among his interests, he lists literature, philosophy, traveling, and of course, gemstones. And during his 20 year cutting career, he has developed his skills to competition grade and being successful at the highest level. He is now passing this knowledge on to his students, some of whom in turn um, have taught others uh, the art of gem cutting. And Victor's philosoph philosophical stone collection was the first to express images and parables by way of facet patterns and was followed by his elements, flowers and heritage collections, which reinforced this concept. Now he continues to produce new ideas and collections and we will no doubt hear about them or some of them today. And uh, we're lucky to have Victor because this is actually his third time, the third time we've tried to get him at this particular gathering. Uh, the th first time we were going to give it in the hotel and we, everything was planned and uh, it was due to be on the 19th of December. And on the 18th of December, he contacted me and sent me some pictures to prove that he couldn't make it from his hospital bed. And he was having his gallstones removed, which um, obviously was um, bad for him and slightly alarming for us. But we managed to do the 114th gathering. And then we rescheduled uh, the event for March the 25th. And then COVID appeared. So we had to cancel or at least we postponed that event. And here we are tonight. So now we've gone from sort of the, the, the event happening in the hotel to actually being here with him online. So really that uh, leaves it open to Victor to uh, take the floor and I'll stop sharing my screen and then Victor will be able to share his screen and start his presentation. So over to you, Victor, and thank you. Thank you, Nick. The expression precision cut becomes very popular this time. Let's try to clear what does it mean from different market players and how much one cut is more precise than another. I used to hear different definitions. Somebody says that precision cut is made by automatic machines under the same design, same size and with the same defects. And other people characterize such more or less symmetrical gemstones with small window, average polish, but rare and quite valuable. Somebody else tells that precision cut should be innovative, containing concave facets and even elements of carving. More complicated design, more precise cut is. Finally, some experts believe that precision cut is anything differs from standard shapes. How is possible to join this opinion to one point? The reply is obvious. According to the meaning of this sentence, precision cut should be precise in first queue. Only precise. Not innovative, not artistic, not valuable, just precise. It means that gemstone should not have faceting defects. I mean noticeable defects. Two questions appear here. What does faceting defect mean and how much it could be noticeable? As you told, participating, judging and organizing the technical faceting competitions gave me some experience in this field and I will try to summarize it. To answer the question about faceting defects, let's take our gemstone not only as a whole, but as a complex of separate design elements, so-called pattern points, such as facets, edges, midpoints, where four or more facets join together, and pairs of symmetrical facets, according to initial faceting design. Each pattern point of the real stone could differ from the ideal. For example, facet surface could have scratches, pits, unevenness, cracks, and so on. Edges could be not straight, chipped, rounded, and so on. Midpoints 
could be not points, but extra edges. Finally, equal facets could differ in size or shape as well. According to its noticeability, all defects could be divided into three categories. Barely visible with 10 times loop, well visible through the loop and barely visible with naked eye, and well visible with naked eye. Unwanted optical effects such as window or light extinction should be named as well. After summarizing all these defects in each category, we can talk about calculating cut quality in numbers with quite high accuracy and objectivity. So, to make precision cut, it is necessary to minimize faceting defects, solving such problems while they occur. Fortunately, I didn't learn from professional cutters. I got my initial skills from amateur Russian lady who is serious scientist and cut stones just as a hobby. Nobody stopped me during my work. I did not scare to strive the perfection and reach it. Therefore, I did not know limits typical for professionals. Experienced cutters smiled in the beginning of my way. Why we need to waste so much time for perfect midpoints? Who needs such mirror-like polish? Should we lose precious parts of carrot for closing window? People say, if difference is invisible, why should we pay more? But a big mistake is hidden here. Difference is not just noticeable, it is obvious and can increase price of gemstone much more than expenses for precision cut. Let me explain and substantiate this sentence. Let's look for 13 years ago to 2007. It was my second single stone competition provided by the U US Faceters Guild, Master Division. I cut the competition stone and before sending it to the judges, I showed it to one rich man in Moscow. He asked me to cut the same one for him. I cut gem but could not give him, my customer disappeared somehow. As I cut the same second time, this stone was a bit more precise than the first one. Some midpoints were more perfect, some facets were polished better. Of course, just competition cutter could notice this difference, just through the loop and just with correct lighting. But I showed both stones together to many people and asked which one is better. As a rule, everybody named the second one. Nobody can say why, just they like it more. It was the real discovery. Actually, our eye is so perfect optical instrument that can see much more than our brain can realize. This difference is not seen, but is felt on the level of emotions, like more or less. But in that particular case, the difference was tiniest. Two of the same stones cut by the same master, almost one by one. And even such insignificance can influence the buyer decision to buy or not to buy, because this decision is made under emotions very often. But if one stone is cut by real master and another one by commercial cutter? If one stone is cut precisely and another one just commercially? You understand what I mean? All the last years until now, I worked and still continue my work on this difference. When this work will be finished, I will share the results with public. But now, Let's stop on one very important gemological characteristic, probably the most important for colored stones, on color. Let's see how precision cut, rather to say mirror-like polish, influences the gem color. I saw it first time just occasionally. In 2016, 
I started to give classes on precision cut in GIT here in Bangkok. Some samples from cubic zirconia were cut by me during the teaching. Groups were different. Some students gave me more time for cutting. Some of them took more my attention. As a result, once I did not have enough time to polish my sample, worked with students a lot. I finished at pre-polish stage. It is similar to final polish for most of gems on the market. Well, it was just a sample, not for sale, of course. I just put it together with another stone, which was cut on previous classes, and I saw. Two absolutely different stones were before my eyes. Rather to say, color was the same, but with different tone and saturation. But it was the same material from one piece of cubic, which has no color zoning. Gem design and angles were the same as well. What influenced the color so much? Answer could be just one, polish. To understand the reason, I looked at the physics, to be exact optics. Let's recall what size of diamond grains is used for polishing by commercial cutters. One or two microns. It allows to polish quite fast with an appropriate quality. Facets shine brightly under daylight or gemological lamp. But surface looks a bit glossy under spotlight when light reflection is removed from the facet. It occurs because diamonds of such size leave scratches wider than lengths of visible light waves from 0.4 to 0.8 microns. It means light not only reflects or refracts on the facet plane, but diffuse a little bit, and unawareness of surface partially reflects all surroundings. It gives some grayish compound to the color of gemstone and makes it slightly lighter because most of things around are the additional sources of reflected light. As a result, we see not a real, but visible color of gemstone, which differs from the real one. It was not my purpose to calculate exactly how much good polish changes gem color. Maybe somebody from GIA will check it carefully and make the real research on this subject. You have perfect instruments for that, including lasers and microscopes, which allow to measure depth and density of polishing lines, compare them with wavelengths of certain sources of light, calculate the reflection intensity and get visible color characteristics and numbers. I didn't have such task. I just can confirm this fact and explain why it happens. In addition, I can say that difference in color due to polish quality strongly depends on the character of light source. Under diffused or daylight, it is not so obvious, but absolutely changes gemstone under many spotlights. It also should be taken into consideration. Now, I want to show how polish can change price of gemstone using not abstract synthetic material, but concrete gem with absolutely real value. Last year, I should repair unheated Madagascar sapphire of almost 16 carats from Santa Enterprises company. I had to remove big chip near girl and also repolish. It was my initiative. My customer didn't know how color depends on polish. You can see difference. Before repolish, stone was certified in GIA as just blue. Now it becomes cornflower blue. That is also confirmed by GIA report. The stone lost for repair just a half a carat or a little more than 3% three, 3%. and losses for repolish should not be taken into consideration at all. It is not more than one hundredth of carrot, I'm sure. Of course, I don't want to say that cut in common and polish in particular improves the own color of gemstone. Let me stress again, perfect polish allows us 
to see the real gem color, which does not decrease saturation due to diffusing light on facet surface. And abscess of window or extension lets us to focus on the stone color only. So, we talked about two first questions in the name of my lecture, how and why. Now let's try to answer the third question, when? Yes, we have, if we have a flawless piece of rough with amazing color of middle tone and high saturation, no need to discuss, should we cut precisely or commercial cut could be enough. I'm absolutely sure that cut quality should be not less than material quality, but not so many cutters can cut precisely although they have access to fine rough. Recutting of gemstone becomes more and more popular with raising market of fine cut. What does recut mean? What kinds of recut could be? When we need to recut stone and when we get the maximum effect from recut? All these questions are not so simple as look like. First time, I talked about gem recutting on my lecture at the Gemological Symposium in Paris five years ago. I already have some results at that time, but I started to use systematic and scientific approach to this subject just recently, to be exact, last year. All particular kinds of recut could be divided into three main categories. Total recut with possible changing of shape, the stone, partial recut with the same shape but possible change in design, and simple repolish the existing facets. First of all, let me stress, the purpose of recut is increasing price of gemstone. It is clear that complete recut takes significant losses and could be used just if cost of final gem is much more than simply material. For example, in case of artistic cut, when the master creates an art object using cheap rough, like quartz or topaz, for example. Uh, this wonderful lotus was cut from kunzite, already faceted, of 257 carats white. I lost about 37% while cutting it, but during a few years, it was a jewel of my exposition at many exhibitions in different countries. This year, stone was bought for Arizona Museum collection. I will not tell too much on artistic cut. It is subject for another lecture. But it could be noted, if price of painting includes not only expenses for paints, canvas, and the working time of artist, the same could be told about faceting of art objects. This particular design named Touching to Perfection. A parable was written to it, saying that the real artist can use any tools to reflect the perfection, such as canvas, paper, marble, or crystal for faceting. The most popular category is recut with the same shape of gemstone. There are not so many classical shapes, round, oval, cushion, octagon, pear, but there are different cutting style, styles as well. For instance, in Brazil, cutters used mostly Portuguese cut. In Asia, step pavilion and brilliant crown. As a rule, commercial cutters don't think too much about correct optics, making pavilion too bulge. It increases weight of stone, but window appears and doesn't allow to disclose color completely. Usually people close their eyes to this because until now the material was selling on the market, not gemstone itself. But nowadays more and more attention is paying to cut quality and perfectly cut stones are more welcome with the same other characteristics. I think it will be more and more on the market. That's why cutters started to improve already faceted stones. Losses in this category strongly depend on shape of initial gem and could deviate from 10 to 30 percent. 
the most favorable case when stone has deep and not so bulged pavilion. Could be typical for some sapphires. We need just cut off a little bit around culet. For example, exactly such case happened with this spinel from Burma. I recut it for my friend and lost just about 9% of weight. Difference in price is quite obvious. If stone has medium deep pavilion and window due to some belly, it is also not bad. We need to remove only this belly. It will cost the same 10-15% of initial weight. But if windowed stone has no belly with low pavilion, then we have to decrease face of gemstone, cutting off the girdle area. In this case, we will lose too much, 25-30% or even more. Another factor should be taken into consideration calculating possible losses, so-called magical size. For example, price per carat for ruby of 5 plus carats is much more than the same ruby a little less than 5 carats. Therefore, if weight of, for example, unheated royal blue sapphire is 10.2 carats, we need to think a lot before deciding to recut it. Well, now let's talk about rare and interesting category of recut. I mean repolish. Rather to say, it should be divided into two subcategories. Repolish with correcting facets symmetry and midpoints and just repolish using the existing facets without changing their shape. Actually, just repolish is not so simple. If we want to minimize losses, of course. To repolish some facet, first of all, we should find it. I mean, to find coordinates of each facet, angle and index. If stone was cut initially on faceting machine with good symmetry, it could be much easier. In this case, we can predict quite precisely where symmetrical facets could be. But usually, each of many facets should be found individually, as a rule, Catching facets needs much more time than repolish itself. It was made for this 92 carats flawless Paraiba tourmaline. I spent almost one week to catch each of more than 300 facets and lost just about 0.02 carats. But according to the owner, price increased for about 10% due to brightness, brilliance, and saturation of color. I just told about weight losses. Repolish with correction symmetry takes not much. We usually lose not more than two or 3% of initial weight. If we tell about repolish the existing facets, losses are tiniest, tens or even hundreds of the percent. My first repolished stone was 44 carats unheated Sri Lankan sapphire. You can see it on the screen. During my work, I lost a little more than one hundredth of carat only, about 0.03%. Now you can understand why I am ready to classify it as separate subcategory. Comparing with repolish with correction, we lose almost 100 times less material it is similar to diamond hardness, 10 times, 10 times more than nearest neighbor sapphire. I want to say again that such repolish is the highest level in gem cutting. No doubts, it should not be entrusted to regular cutter. One time, my friend from Belgium came to me. He is gem cutter in second generation, son of gem cutter and cut stones by himself more than 15 years already. He came just to learn polishing. After four days classes, when he finished to polish first stone under my technique, he exclaimed, it is a totally different world. I have never seen somebody in Europe who can produce such polish. As he wrote me then, showing the stone to his customer, he immediately got nine new orders. Can you imagine? 
Now we can bring such new quality, uh, how we can bring such new quality standards to the market. One of my customers who bought a few of my gemstones reproached me then. What did you do with me? Now I cannot find anything on the market. Just one look through the loop and I lose any wish to buy this gem. But I am here exactly on this reason. Our token is just small brick in the wall, just small particle of the work I'm planning to do for this purpose. This work covers all players of gemstone market. I work with customers, private buyers and collectors, showing my stones and talking about their specialties. I work with jewelers and jewelry brands, creating new gemstone designs and cutting particular stones. I worked with gem dealers, making initial cutting and recutting as well. I work with cutters, teaching them and sharing my skills and experience. I'm proud to say that many of them got quite high results on faceting competitions, such as my Russian student Pavel Filinov, who won the single stone competition provided by the US Faceters Guild in Grand Master Division with the perfect score, 100 points from 100. And I was very impressed by achievements of Taiwanese cutters, students of my friend and student Daniel Hu. They got many awards at the International Facet and Challenge in Australia. And one of them, Liao Man Ling, became a new champion with absolute score, 300 points from 300, breaking my 10 years old record. It was my dream when my students overcome me and my students in second generation made my dream true. Finally, I work with gemologists and appraisers talking at the conferences about new news of precision cut. Before I said about number expression of cut quality, following the competition judging criteria, I created new cut grading system with main advantages, high accuracy and objectivity. But it could be subject for another token. At the end, let me say a couple of words about prospects. What is planned to do in the nearest future? Basing on the rich experience of participating, organizing and judging of faceting competitions, I created concept of the World Faceting Cup the International Technical Faceting Competition. Three judges from the top competition cutters of America, Europe, and Asia will examine stones of participants using the above mentioned cut grading system. Besides cash prices, the world top faceters rating list will be created and refreshed every year on the result of this competition. This official rating list will be accessible for all interested persons including gem dealers, collectors, gemologists, and others who can need the precision cut. Now we discuss the details of this project with ICA and gem fields. In this discussion, if this discussion will be successful, I think it will be official, officially announced soon. So if you have any question, I will try to answer it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, that was uh, very, very good, giving us a detailed account of your experiences and cutting, etc. Um, there are a few questions. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, one which is, uh, which is the gem material that has challenged you the most in cutting? I mean, whether it's relating to the, the physical properties or the optical properties. So, for example, because of the cleavage planes, the number of cleavage planes, or is it uh, pleochroism, or is it a combination of them? So what is the most challenging gem material, basically, that you have, have worked on? Uh, from my experience, um, there were a few materials. Uh, kunzite is very challenging. It's a fresh memory because I just finished uh, one big concert, you know about it. Um, soft stones, 
in general, sphalerites, fluorites, uh, and so on. Uh, I still um, plan to try very soft material like sulfur or halide, uh, something like this. Maybe it will be much more challenging than what I have experienced with. Um, and uh, material with low refractive index is also quite difficult to, uh, to choose design uh, to optimize angles because um, material with high refractive index uh, can, can be improve, improved in color due to uh, multiple internal reflections. But uh, with low refractive index, it's almost impossible to do. So uh, low refractive index, fragile material, and soft material. Okay. So, um, I mean, of course, the critical angle comes into this a lot. It's very important when we're, we're cutting the gems and uh, dealing with the angles, uh, total internal reflection. Um, so you have to be a master of uh, not only the cutting, but the actual sort of experience of how to um, produce the best out of a piece of rough. So this obviously is very important to any cutter. Um, I, I was knowing from, from your discussion, you were talking about recutting is one thing and then just repolishing is another. So surely if you're repolishing the surface of, of a gem, you are having to do a degree of recutting, even if it's just repolishing, because you're, you're going to have to readjust the facet uh, meet points. Is, isn't that correct? Uh, yes, um, as I told, uh, I divided this, uh, it's um, into two subcategories, repolish with correcting and uh, just repolish existing facets. In the last case, I should catch each facet exactly, uh, not uh, touch it before I catch, but when I, I'm sure that I'm exactly on the surface, just then I, uh, I repolish it. And I repeat this uh, operation with each facet one by one. So it, it, it takes a long time. Uh, I think no need to repolish quartz or topaz, just valuable stones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we, we have some, some questions as well um, that I can uh, ask you from people we know pretty well between us. I mean, if I gave you the names, you'd know. Um, I have one saying that uh, you are the master of polish, uh, but you are more than that. What makes such a good artist maths or philosophy? Uh, maybe I'm firstly philosopher and uh, just secondly cutter. Uh, before cutting gemstones, I wrote some fairy tales, uh, poems uh, with philosophical meaning. Now I do the same, uh, but in gemstones. So uh, gemstone for me, just an instrument to express my idea. Okay. That's, that's why. <laughs> yes. Well, we can see, you know, the results of your work. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I, I, I've looked at uh, your sort of various uh, cuts on your Facebook page, for example, and, and um, some, some of the work is absolutely spectacular. And of course, the art of not only doing the cutting, but showing that to everybody via photography also shows um, it's very important. Um, to get the best out of the stone to when you're actually marketing something. So, so this is another aspect of, of the work. Um, obviously, there, there are questions from various people that I, I can answer um, later. Um, but yes, okay, you're, you're going to show some stones? <laughs> no? <laughs> yes, of course, I, I can show some pieces. Okay. Um, just, yeah. Uh -huh. Um, but I had uh, another question from someone. Yeah. Uh, let's see. H have you cut 
uh, because you, you're doing mostly what you've been discussing so far is, you know, corundum and uh, spodumene, etc. But have you ever worked on any inorganic um, or biogenic materials? Uh, some, sometimes I cut pearls. Yeah. I saw one that you did. <laughs> it's a good question. That's why I asked it. <laughs> it's logical. Yeah. So um, could you maybe give us some idea about your experiences of working with um, pearls? Because I presume that was the faceted pearls that you did. Um, yes. You know, uh, everybody knows that pearl is uh, translucent. But when I polished um, my first pearl, I realized that nacre layer is not translucent, but transparent. It looks translucent because of matter surface. Same with glass. If you make matter surface, it will be translucent. But if you polish it well, it will be transparent. And uh, when I saw it on the Taishan pearl, <laughs> it, it was so uh, so amazing to see. I, I never can um, I never can think about it, but it was so interesting. Right, because obviously, the majority of pearls, when we're looking at a pearl, it's not really translucent or transparent or even semi, but, it, but it's the surface area, the very top part of any part of a pearl yes. usually will have some translucency to it. So it's, it's the, the outermost layers and mm -hmm. that's what you're probably referring to in this respect. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. If we um, polish surface, if we polish mm -hmm. facets on surface, it will be translucent and we can see nucleus inside. You know. Right. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it depend, depends on, if we're talking about pearls, it would depend exactly which type of pearl, etc. Because um, anyway, we're probably going off subject on pearls here. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> hog the, the, the topic about it. But let's see what else. Um, another question is uh, around about uh, learning lapidary. So you, you do teaching. Um, we know that. Is this the, the teaching is open to anybody who wants to uh, ask you, or is it? Um, is there some other more specialized places that people can consider if they want to learn about uh, starting to, to cut stones? Uh, it is difficult to say something now. Uh, before uh, virus, I I taught in GIT. Now I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what will be. Mm. But okay. of course, uh, I, I want to teach and uh, I, I can do it. Right. But you, you've, as you've said, you've been teaching many um, students before and then they've gone on and they've taught their own students who have done very well. So um, this, this is something that you, you will probably come back to later when things hopefully get back to normal. I hope so. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, at the end, what we'll probably do is just ask you for maybe some of the links uh, and the names of um, the, the projects you're working on. I don't know if you have any of the, of the links to the project that you discussed at the end. Maybe we can share that with everybody. Um, is there some information that you can give us now about some of the, the other um, projects that you're working on, the, the ones which came after, like the elements and the flowers? The, the heritage? No, now I, um, I'm working on the heritage, World Heritage Collection, mm -hmm. um, because it's uh, so big, so huge project. Uh, I think it will be for all my life, <laughs> because it, it's, okay. it's bigger than my life. <laughs> right. Because World cult Cultural Heritage is, is yeah. unlimited. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. And okay. I, I just started. Now uh, I created a diagram for the seven stones uh, for Spanish culture. Um, I tried to combine uh, in one stone um, creation of Gaudi, uh, Sagrada Familia, and uh, some Arabic pattern of Alhambra. Uh -huh. 
but okay. I, I didn't cut it yet. Uh, I already have diagram and I will start it uh, in the nearest future. Okay. And, and for example, ju just on, on your last one from the Heritage Project, how long did that take you to cut from start to finish? What, what was the timeline? Uh, good question. It depends um, on material and size, of course. Um, the last stone I cut was uh, the Italian stone from natural quartz. Mm -hmm. I finished it a few days ago. I still have no uh, professional picture. Uh, it will be just maybe in a few days. I will pub I will post it. Um, this stone took me about about a week, oh. maybe a bit more. But okay. previous one, it was a Fr French stone, um, Notre Dame, from Kunzite. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I spent more than three months for this stone. Wow, that's a big difference then. That, that was purely because of uh, the cutting, as we discussed before, the, the, the cleavage planes, etc. And yes. all of this you had to factor in. Okay. And, and uh, of course, the size. Yeah, because the size too. Very, very you had to make uh, the special um, holders, etc. for that size stone as well. It, they weren't just standard available in the market. So everything had to be made for that size stone. Uh, I think this, uh, this size is not for jewelry, of course. It's uh, for uh, collect collections, for mm -hmm. museums, for uh, private collectors. <clears throat> because <clears throat> when somebody asked me, uh, why you cut such big stones, uh, it's impossible to set into jewelry. Um, I can ask, for example, painting. You set it on the wall. You don't want to uh, to take it with yourself with um, uh, yourself somewhere. You look and enjoy. The same with big stone. You take it, look, and okay. enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. And put back. <laughs> yeah, so not exactly the, the easiest to wear that sort of size. Agreed. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you actually do a lot of uh, recutting you talked about um, for people who, who, for instance, will buy something at auction? Um, is that a lot of the sort of work that you do or, or is it uh, other types of work mainly? Uh, approximately, uh, it is uh, about 20-30% of my work, not more. Okay, right, okay. All right. But now more and more, you know, now more than before. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I think, I think that's probably it on the questions, seems to be. Um, okay. So thank you very much, Victor. Let me just uh, go and share my screen. Right, so um, as I said, thank you very much to everybody who's joined us tonight. And um, it's good to see quite a few people came and uh, listened to Victor. Um, obviously, we we're hearing from the master about the cutting and you can see some of his work. If, if anyone sort of wants to see and doesn't know about his work, then I'm, I'm sure we can go to Facebook or um, we, we can probably supply some links later to, that Victor can give us and, and it'll take you to see some of the resources where you might be able to sort of learn more about him. Um, and just in leaving, I'd say that uh, uh, we have one more of the regular knowledge sessions um, from GIA, which is tomorrow evening, um, and it's being given by Dr. Wu Yi Wang. Um, and uh, you can see the title is Diamond Color Treatment and its Identification. So this will be tomorrow um, uh, evening in Bangkok time at 11 p.m., which is actually 9 a.m. Pacific um, daylight time. So if anyone wants to learn a bit more about the diamonds, then uh, please uh, re register for that and, and join that session. Vic, 
Doctor, thank you very much for coming here tonight and uh, joining us and sharing your knowledge and experience. Um, in actual fact, just before, because we've got a little bit of time before we, we get to the hour, I got seems to be <laughs> one, one more question has appeared. I don't know if you want to do, I mean, we've got about five, five or so minutes left. The, the question basically is, can you show more stones, Victor? Yes, why not? <laughs> so may, maybe we just uh, end on, on you showing a few stones and, um, and then we'll leave it at that. So maybe you can show the stone and okay. also please give us a little bit of information on it. Like, for example, what the stone is. I mean, is it... Um, is it corundum? I know it's not going to be a, that big, probably. You've brought things like um, topaz or whatever. So let us know the name of the stone, maybe the, the carat weight of it. Um, now some more questions are coming. This always happens at the end, Victor. But anyway, start with the stones. Show, okay. show a couple of stones. Uh, stone which was on um, uh, the first page of uh, our webinar. This is a Chinese stone. Uh, from citrine, Brazilian citrine, uh, 187 carats and uh, uh, more than 600 facets. Notre Dame. Focus, okay. Cubic zirconia about 400 carats. Uh, unfortunately, camera cannot show the real beauty. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, anyway, yes. I mean, it's a, we're a bit limited with a, um, a, a camera set up like that. It's, it's not, uh, not the same as actually seeing it in person. So, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the beauty of the gatherings like we used to have them, where you can turn up in person and handle them if you let them handle them and see for themselves, etc. So obviously now we're working online and we have some slight restrictions, but uh, at least uh, uh, we're, we can still be together during these times. Yes, I, I hope uh, next time we will uh, meet together personally and uh, I, can, I can show it. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think that's, that's it on the questions now. Um, we've just had a few people saying thank you very much and uh, you know, comments like beautiful. Um, so yes, uh, thank, you, thank you very much again, Victor. And uh, I think that's, thank, that's it for thank this you. evening. Thank you uh, very much. Thank okay, you. And thank you very much everyone for, for joining us and uh, we hope to see you again in future. Bye, take care.